Spotlight is back, and in this fourth iteration, we have an incredible array of indie artists and their art to introduce you to. The right-wing theocrats in the Supreme Court have now, have now officially done something that will essentially reverse the expansion of rights that were given to us by the very same court less than 50 years ago. They have reversed Roe v. Wade, meaning that the constitutional protections for women's reproductive rights no longer exist. I mean, all of these, I think all of these justices should be seen basically as politicians. I always get frustrated when people dig oh, into yeah. like the jurisprudence. It, it's all bullshit. I'm they gonna, just, I'm they have an nice ideological feel. lens. They decide right. what they want to do. No, we're in super dark times. So there is no bottom to this battle. One of the things that, that saddens me the most in and around the conversation of, of women's reproductive rights in America is the fact that it has been distilled into a catchphrasey, nuance-lacking conversation that I think robs all of society, and women in particular, of, of, of the conversation that an issue deserves. They want to use women for their bodies. They don't care about women. That's where we are today. And there are still eight more decisions extant by the Supreme Court. Um, and we're gonna have, I mean, this is just gonna keep coming. Women's rights in America are under attack. Well, Joe Compton sat down with two women who weren't waiting to hear the answer to the question of what's next. And Carol Geisander and Rachel Broom, who do what they do best, organized a bunch of writers, presenting them with an opportunity to write some fictional horror around this very real and scary situation. Under the guise of Rachel's imprint, Crone Girls Press, a charity anthology was born. As we turn the spotlight, on a woman unbecoming. All right, so let's let's start by talking about how this all came together. What I mean, obviously, the idea was stemmed from what is happening in our world, but kind of go over how the evolution of it became, you know, from a thought of let's do an anthology to a crone girls press anthology to all of that. How did, how did this all come about? Well, Rachel had the initial inspiration. So I think we'll let her talk about that part. Um, so in our crone girls press authors group, um, I just, yeah, I was like, this is probably a bad idea, but um i've been thinking about this and i need to do something and i'm thinking about doing something along these lines and one by one people started reacting to that and um some people were just like you know thumbs up good you know good idea but people were like oh i would contribute i would contribute i'm like okay well you know originally i'd envisioned it as probably people who had already contributed to a Chrome Girls Press anthology would want to throw me a story and maybe we'd get 40,000 words of stories, we'd publish it and it would be something that we could do. Um, and then it just kind of took on a life of its own. <laughs> and then I went and had lunch with Carol when I was up in New Jersey. And then um, I think I, I was like, you know, what, what would it I think I asked the question because Carol's got a lot more experience, um, especially in the horror world. And I was like, you know, I have a story, but I'm also the editor. I just don't know if that would be okay to do something like that. Um, and Carol's like, well, you know, sometimes people have co-editors. And I just looked at her. And I was like, they do. And I went, yeah. I mean, we didn't even have words. She just went, mm, and I said, okay. 
<laughs> because it's such an important topic. It really, mm -hmm. really is. And uh, and then I, I got uh, involved with the project and I started asking some people that I knew in the horror world uh, and some folks had some uh, some stories on hand. Some folks wrote some. Um, we One thing was very fun. Uh, I um, co-host the Galactic Terrors Reading event from HWA New York chapter on second Thursdays at eight o'clock Eastern. And um, we had Tara Laskowski, who is a mystery writer and thriller uh -huh. writer who, who also writes some dark stuff. And she read this really cool piece. And as soon as it was over, I, I emailed Rachel. I said, I want this. And she says, go for it. So then I emailed Tara and I said, we, we print that in our anthology and she's like absolutely oh positively what a great idea so you know some things just fell into our lap for the project it was really it was really yeah, for, for an anthology that had an a stemmed from an idea of something that happened in current events this came together pretty quickly is, is that kind mm -hmm. of an unusual thing for did was that is this all happenstance that these are happy accidents and Kismet, did it feel kind of like the energy was there to kind of kind of really get this thing rolling and then it just started to roll like a, on its own? Is that the idea? Energy yeah. and intent, I think, the two together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and focus and spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> yeah. yes. Rachel and I are friends because we both clipboard and spreadsheet well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, it was especially nice because I clipboard and spreadsheet, but then I'll get distracted and go off into squirrel land. And it's nice to have somebody that when we need to like kind of tug each other back into reality, <laughs> that happens. You know, the joke of all that is uh, my kid's camp name was Squirrel when they were a camp counselor. Um, and so I have been Mama Squirrel for the last 10 years. So that, that we, we squirrel equally well is, is all. But um, no, it, I, I appreciated the fact that Rachel pointed out at the very beginning, we want to get this thing done in a hurry because yeah. this is an important topic for right now. We want the word out there. And uh, frankly, also, a, a lot of people have been doing anthologies like this, and we wanted to get out there as soon as we could and, and get some attention for both our authors and for the topic while it was still on fresh in people's minds. So this entire project was put together in two months. Normally, when you do an anthology through a, you know, medium or, or larger press, it'll be a year, a year yeah. and a half. Um, Rachel and I used to work together on Writer Punk Press, which was a charity press that funded no-kill animal shelters. And we didn't know what we were doing at the beginning there. So it, it took me five and a half months to edit an entire anthology and get it out. And I thought I was being really slow. I didn't know that we were insane then. So we just, like turn that dial up to 11 on on the uh the intensity here but everybody also was really willing you know people wrote pieces for us in in a week you know got it to us in a week uh it was it was incredible and the, the horror slant is where where you guys really make your money right this is where you're, ban you're banking on it being a little different and that's kind of an interesting idea i mean this this topic is polarizing enough just politically you know and and just talking about it and then to add the horror element did you have any parameters did you feel like you had to kind of make a fence or did you just say let's run wild and see how far this can how far we can go with all of these stories so we did give a um kind of like a like a verbal vision board, I guess you would call it. Uh -huh. um, I gave people an idea of what kind of stories, like I gave them some comp titles. So the title, A Woman I'm Becoming, is the title of a short story by C.M. Harris that was in Compass and Break, which was our second full-length anthology. And that was the energy that I really wanted to capture because it is a very vibrant energy. It's very violent Mm -hmm. And it's uncompromising and it's unapologetic. Nice. Um, so that was kind of where I, I was looking to at first. I was like, this is the story. Um, I even approached her. I was like, hey, do you mind if we title our anthology after your story and also include it? And <laughs> she was. Is she, she going to say no? Yeah. No. Well, you, know, you, you never it know. It is polite to ask. It is polite to um, ask. 
and especially because the the story she's working on incorporating it as a chapter in a book so i wasn't sure if she would want to to do something that's going to be an awesome book that yeah, is going to be an awesome fantastic. book the story it, it the power in that story it just takes my breath away when i read it it really does it was one of those where you find like when it's the sort of story that editors, when they're going through their slush pile, that's the story they're hoping to find. <laughs> um, and, it, and it just captured a lot of the energy that, for me, when I was thinking like Chrome Girls Press, like that's the sort of energy. And as stories started coming in, I think people really understood what we were going for. They were really capturing it. Some of the stories, the first time I read them, um, I was like, this story is awesome. I don't know if it's really for us. And I would go talk to Carol and she would point out, hey, what about this? And so I think as an editor, sometimes there's always a point in a process of every anthology. And this is our fourth or fifth one where I have to step outside of my own ideas and it, and kind of open up a little bit. And so when we did that, we just got so many great stories that didn't fit narrowly into the theme. They explored a whole a whole region around the theme. Um, some of the stories like just dead on. Uh, mm. Jennifer Nostoiko's story after the funeral, <laughs> like oh yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but then you also have stories like Nicole Givens Kurtz Lipstick Smile, which comes at the theme. Um, like if you read it, you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, this is definitely on theme, but the more you think about it, it's got themes of um, conformity and conforming to the male gaze and conforming to unrealistic beauty standards. And that's all part of a woman, um, you know, the, the sort of strictures and boundaries that get put on women identifying um, human beings so that they yeah. can pass, so they can yeah. pass as human or it passes women. Um, yeah. So yes, yeah, so we've got a pretty good mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you yeah. have you have some males in there too that that, that contribute to this. To, to, were you surprised by that? How much you got from that, or was that kind of like expected? You were, I mean, some no. of the the people that you have in there, you you've known for a while, so you probably yeah weren't that yeah. Surprised, but and 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 that it, it's not so much surprising, but heartwarming and and yeah. exciting. You right. know that it's not just women who see these issues. Uh, you know, it, it, we're talking about righteous rage and anger and you know that that's something that affects everybody but you know we're looking particularly at folks who have you know tied into reproductive issues that face these things and so the fact that it's not just folks I, who are uh, identified as women but lots and lots of people and not only stories we have poems mm -hmm. as well which is very cool um, and in, in some cases the poems encapsulate these issues so tightly that it's really, really intense. So, yeah. And um, in, in answer to that question, no, I wasn't surprised at all. Mm -hmm. um, the folks who submit stories to a press called Crone Girls Press are usually yeah. confident and comfortable yeah. with who they are. Um, and in, Carol and I had talked about this, um, I think, on another panel. For us, it's not one gender or the other that's the focus. Mm -hmm. It's the systemic issues that happen when you have people in power who are looking to place legal controls on bodily autonomy. And that is something that affects everybody, whether they want to admit it or not. Like I was not surprised at all that someone like Michael G. Williams would submit the story that he submitted, which is, I had to read it like the first time I read, it, I'm like, God, I love this story. Then the second time I read, it, I'm like, God, I love this story. Now I am understanding what's going on here. It's fantastic. I love it. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, an, I was absolutely not surprised at all that he would um, have something like that for us. Mm -hmm. And this is a charity anthology, correct? Is this a charity anthology? Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I've actually reached out to the two charities to see if they would mind if we, said who we were doing it, um, who we were supporting, but they haven't gotten back to me yet. So we're supporting uh, established organizations who have been doing this work for a while. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and that was really important to me as well. Now, I, I think we've done this in such a hurry uh, that they haven't had time to get back to us, but it, it's very important to me that we are supporting agencies and groups that have been doing this for a while because every, there's so much talk that, oh, all this stuff about reproductive health, people need assistance, let's go start a new agency. Well, there are groups that have been helping people with reproductive services for the last five decades, if not longer, because, you know, even though abortions were illegal, there is a lot of problems in the world for people to actually get access to the services, even though it may not be against the law. There's, you know, there's funding, there's availability, there's transportation, there's support. So there are groups that are helping people through these topics and through these issues for a long time. So there's no reason whatsoever to go out and start our new agency. Let's support the ones who already have the, the feet on the ground and know what they're doing. Was there anybody who surprised you in the angle they took in writing in the story that they submitted? Was there any surprises that you, you came across that you were like, wow, I didn't think we could get an angle like that from this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was a lot of, and I did not expect this in retrospect, I probably should have, but there was a lot of, um, pagan esque oh. stories uh -huh. and stories about old goddesses returning Jude, power. <laughs> power yeah. yes. Um, Jude Reed is, I don't want to give away the ending, but it was again, along these lines of, an ancient goddess reclaiming power in the world. Raven Crescent had a similar story. Karina Bissett, um, her poem was along similar lines. And looking back, like I said, obviously this shouldn't have been a surprise. Um, and it, as an editor, I was like, oh, this is actually really cool. I'm glad people <laughs> sent these in. But yeah, that was, that was, it was very pleasant to read. I was enjoying it quite a lot. And, and Jude's story was a silver bow new bent. Yes. So uh, intense, very intense. Was that the slap that you felt like you weren't expecting to, Carol? Yes, and I, I was intrigued uh, with some of the things we got. Even the the poem by Teal James Glenn, it, it's clearly speaking from a female perspective from folks that he's known as his friends, that, that he clearly encapsulated what a lot of his friends have talked to him about and was able to present it in words. And I think that was very cool, you know, tying in with their earlier question as well. So that was, that was pretty neat. Obviously you had a purpose, you had a, you had an aim, you have a goal for this and you're looking at it and, and putting it out there for a reason, but were you, was there moments when you were overwhelmed and surprised by what you were receiving? Were, do you feel like, there was an emotional element to this that you didn't expect you would have when you when you started yes. reading, putting this together. Yes. And, you know, looking at individual stories, some of them had a strong impact on me. But I tell you, once we put them in order and, and Rachel had some great suggestions on that, once I sat down and I read the first five stories, I had to put the book down. Mm. I could not keep reading. I had to go, oh, it, it was wow. Wow. So very cool. <laughs> How about for you, Rachel? Um, I would say that uh, I do, I don't publish just any story that leaves me cold. Yeah. Um, every, every story that I ever publish or poem, it has engendered some emotional reaction. Working on this project helped me work through my own emotions, mm. if that makes sense, because I was so, 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 so upset was completely unsurprised, but was so completely overwhelmed and upset that if there hadn't been a creative outlet to work through that, I think it would have been really bad. It would have been worse than it was. Um, and especially being able to work with it, it within a group, um, work with Car to work with Carol, um, to work with the authors, and then the folks in the, the Facebook group and the Chrome Girls Authors Facebook group um, our publisher's assistant, Raven Crescent, who also has a story in there, um, working with her to, to come up with the graphics, to come up with the social media postings, all of that just really helped work through those very strong emotions and give them a place to go and um, be productive. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. So, it, it was that or do extra weeding in the garden, and I would much rather do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the day, when, when you look look at this and you, and you put it out there, what is your aim for where this can go, what this is about? Is this, is this just a cathartic exercise, or is it more of an awareness anthology? Where do you place it upon the pinnacles of anthology and, and why and why you put it out there. I hope that people read it and realize they're not alone mm. in the emotions that they're going through, in the betrayal that they feel, in the anger that they feel. Um, one of the reasons that I love horror is that it never, um, at least the, the horror that I read, gives you a place to experience extreme emotions and take risks. Mm -hmm. And that is what I hope this anthology will give to its readers is a place to work through those, um, work, work through those dark places and, and come mm -hmm. out on the other side and, 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 and feel like a, you've done something um, cause you have, if you buy this, um, we'll send the money to the charities. Um, but also feel as if you're not alone anymore. Yes, exactly. And I, I also think it's important to have works out there that keep this topic in the front of everybody's mind, because we know what the news cycle is like, the next catastrophe is going to come up and, you know, it's easy to start to forget. And oh, yeah, it's already been worked. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, it already has. And so um, I, I was actually just at a story fest up in Connecticut, and I met Gwendolyn Keist in person. I've seen her on, on our show and, and such. And so we had invited Gwendolyn Keist to be to write the introduction for this, mm -hmm. because she was one of the people that we immediately saw on Twitter saying, I'm taking a stand to say this is not right. This cannot be. And so I immediately hit her up and she was nice enough to write us an introduction in a week, you know, read the whole thing and wrote it, which was very cool. Um, and uh, so one of the panels was talking about activism and, you know, are you going to be brave enough to put your name out there to support a topic that may not be um, considered appropriate by some people? And, you know, the, the universal response to all this has been, do it. We have a gorgeous cover uh, from Lynn Hansen. Mm -hmm. And the fun thing is we mentioned that there were a bunch of poems. So we, we open with uh, one from Lee Murray and then partway through we have Cindy Quinn and Patricia Gomes, their poem, and then Linda Addison's poem uh, takes us along. And each, each of these, you know, you're going up and up and up and then you get a breath and up and up and up and you get a breath. <laughs> then we've got Teal James Glenn partway through. And then near the end, uh, our, out of our last three pieces, we end with Crystal Orand and uh, Karina Bissett's poems. And uh, I, I think it's a very cool way to start with the poetry and end with poetry. You know, it's very cool. I can gush about every single story and poem. Of course. Uh, yeah. Every single story and poem. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. And, and it was it was interesting. Like, when you start doing a table of contents, I know for me, I'll, I'll write all of the titles out on, on little tiny colored index cards. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll color code them according to the length, whether it's a poem, a flash, or a longer story. And then I'll start laying them out and kind of just going through them and, and reading the book in my head. And it took, this one took a little bit of time, but much less time than some of the other projects to come together, maybe because it was a themed anthology. But the, the fact that we had so many people and they, they, when you read it, yeah, it, it could get a little overwhelming, but what I'm hoping the reader will get is just this really intricate emotional journey because mm -hmm. each of these authors has written up something and that's and it, it every story just had a perfect spot it was it was the perfect story for that perfect spot in the table of contents this feminist indie publisher crone girls has brought together a diverse array of independent authors to explore and celebrate the autonomy power and anger of women facing a world that would deny them what is theirs by right Best of all, the profits will be used to support reproductive health care rights. All speculative fiction and leaning towards horror, I enjoyed every story and poem in this anthology. My emotions ranged from rage and grief to vindication and satisfaction. 
There were twist endings, surprise characters, and even a real-life LOL guffaw. Thank you, Jeff Strand. A very satisfying F the Patriarchy read. So, that I, I was so pleased because that's what we were trying for. So, I, I'm so excited somebody agreed. 